This video is the result of me taping a class that I put together called Book to Battle. This class was held at a Society for Creative Anachronism event called the University of Atlantia in September of 2016. The idea was to help people that were studying historical martial arts and talk about the resources that were available, uh, some of the pitfalls that you could have as you're putting this stuff together, and provide some examples and and mechanisms that you could use to help you more effectively study and recreate historical martial arts. I hope you enjoy the rest of the video. Hello, everybody. Um, we'll see how this goes. Uh, as I said, uh, you're welcome to come up. I have a big selection of a lot of the different rapier manuals that I have up here. This is about two thirds of my collection, maybe a little less then. So there's lots of books out there. Um, what I wanted to do was talk to people about learning from period sources because there's so much out there now, but being able to do something effective with those is very difficult. So, how many people here are trying to recreate one or more historical styles? Hopefully, just about everyone. Um, lots of books, obviously. More and more every day. Um, how many people go on YouTube to, to look at stuff? So, unfortunately, you do get what you pay for. Um, and you don't really pay for YouTube. So, Sometimes the quality is great, sometimes not so great. Uh, obviously, there's classes like this. There's a number of folks that teach uh, historical martial arts professionally. Um, uh, a friend of mine in Vancouver has one of the biggest schools out there, Devin Borman with the uh, 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 Duello School. Um, go to duello.tv for his stuff. And then obviously, self-study. Um, I know there's a lot of different groups here, like Lloyd has a group out in Marinus that is working on Fiore. Um, things to be careful of, anyone that categorically, categorically states this is how it's done. How many people here are actually alive right now in 1590 and are actually trying to use a weapon to keep yourself alive or to kill the other person? Pretty much nobody here. We also, we have, we have uh, compromises we have to make. Um, our weapons are slightly different. Some of them are fairly close, but they're still a little different. We have safety considerations. We have restrictions in what we do. So all of these are compromises, and we need to understand how those compromises affect our ability to reenact. So, so be very careful of that. Um, even with the books, just because someone has made the effort to get something published, whether it's a, a nice bound book, or they've done a blog online, or written a paper and put it out there, that doesn't make them correct. Um, there's someone that published a book recently, and you kind of went, hmm, because they spent a good part of it saying, not that they're great and wonderful and know all these things, but, well, they're so much better than this other guy who put a book out first, because, he, well, he's wrong on this, and he's wrong on this, and he's wrong on that. It's like, well, if you're going to spend your whole time tearing somebody else down, maybe that's not the best recommendation over um, your, your own knowledge. So be careful about that. Context matters in what you're doing. So, the people that were developing or teaching these weapon styles and these, these forms of combat, they didn't do it in a vacuum. They did it in their time period with the weapons that were appropriate for their time, with the clothing that was appropriate for the time, etc. Anyone here working on Destreza, a, a Spanish school? It's, it wants a shorter weapon than Italian, which is what I'm most familiar with. It wants a very simple cross hilt because you do a lot of work where you're holding the cross hilt horizontally and you're doing blade movement across that cross hilt, putting your guard on different sides of the other person's blade as you go to do something. That doesn't work nearly so well if I have a complex cup hilt or a swept hilt or something of that nature. So the sword that I have impacts my ability to do the reenactment. I mean, you can make it even worse. Obviously, you're not going to use a long sword for Italian rapier, but even other stuff makes a big difference. So if you're studying a particular time period, a particular school, a particular style, look at the weapons that are appropriate for that time, that place. That's going to be best match for that. Some of the uh, folks that wrote about this stuff may have gone so far as to say, here's the appropriate weapon for you. Here's the blade length. Capoferro describes the appropriate length um, and talks about arm length and this and that, but what it boils down to is the pommel should sit right about your breastbone. 
Um, other folks, they don't really say anything. Like Gante is very much, you know the basics, I'm going to teach you after that. So he doesn't talk about the weapon you're supposed to use. He doesn't talk about your stance. He doesn't describe guards. None of that. He just assumes you've got this basic foundation, goes from there. But that matters. Your garb matters. Um, people here tend to have, you have modern souls, you have lug souls, you have things with a lot of grip. Well, a lot of your motion depends upon the ability for you to do pivots, which you can do in a leather, well, this isn't leather sole, but it's close enough, shoe, or a nice smooth leather sole. If you've got a lug sole and it's going to grab the grass, guess what? You're not going to be able to move quite the same way. Well, that, that will affect things maybe a lot, maybe a little, but you have to understand that that's another compromise of what you're doing. Most of us here fight, and I'm, I'm talking about rapier, but this obviously impacts armored stuff too. If you're talking heavy rapier in the SCA, it's pretty much all thrust. Yes, there's a draw cut, which is an artificial thing, because at the time we were using lighter weapons and percussive cuts were dangerous for the weapons we had, etc. But it's all thrust. So a lot of the compromises we make are, I'm dealing only with thrusts, and therefore protections against thrusts. Now, when you get into cut and thrust, you have the percussive cut added, and so you can modify for that. For armored combat, you have the artificialness of not supposed to hit from the wrist up or ignore those shots. You know, above the knee, those sorts of things. No matter what kind of combat you have, you can't smash them with the pommel more than once, and your card's pulled. You can't do grappling to the point of breaking the limbs and, and popping the joints and stuff. So there's compromises on what we do, and you have to understand those compromises and how they impact what you're trying to do. Um, so keep that in mind as well. It's, it's no different than, well, I'm trying to cook this meal that I read about in this paper or this book that someone wrote in 1400 Spain, but I don't have the same poultry they have, so I have this difference. So I don't have quite the same spices, so they would use this, but I'm doing that. So you can explain, this is what they would do, this is what I'm doing that gets as close to that as I think is reasonable, and I'm not getting closer because I can't afford that much saffron. I don't have that kind of rice. My blade is too long. I don't want to actually shove a point through someone's skull. You know, little things like that. So understand those compromises. And then people get into, a lot of these books have illustrations, they have plates. Oh, this is the thing that I'm trying to recreate. He's standing exactly like this. First of all, we don't have a lot to work from, but some of that stuff you look at and you go, that just doesn't quite make sense. It's pretty close, but also picture watching a movie of something. And I'll picture someone grabbing a, a frame out of that and handing someone else and saying, this is the thing. This is how you throw a bowling ball. This is how you do whatever. And you've got one frame out of this motion. Plates are the same thing. Typically, they're the very first thing or they're the ending, ending position, but not always. There's also been some discussion that some of these plates are almost like stock photos and that someone did these pictures and a guy said, I want to write a book on Spanish rapier and well, I'm going to take these woodcuts that someone has already done and use them in my book because it's close enough. So you can't discount them completely, but you got to take them with at least a little grain of salt. How many people here have, have, have pulled out a book and tried to work through that? A couple of you, a lot of you. So is some of what I'm talking about starting to make sense? Like, yeah, I've hit this thing. I've hit that problem. Yeah. So, one thing you need to do is you need to constantly question your assumptions. And it sucks because maybe you're right and you talk yourself out of it. Maybe you're kind of wrong and you figure that out. But you're trying to build something and you're trying to improve what you've learned based on that foundation. And then you're trying to improve upon that and trying to improve upon that. Well, if somewhere down in the bottom you've made a false assumption, that kind of upsets the whole thing. And so you're doing stuff that just doesn't work. Or instead of an assumption that's false, 
you understand I'm adapting because my rules don't let me do X. Okay, now you've made a change, but you did it for a reason that makes sense for your circumstances. I can't do this in armored combat. I can't do this in cut and thrust, but I can do this. So let's see how that changes what goes on. So constantly, constantly kind of go back to the beginning and reassess and then pick up from there and then go back and reassess and pick up from there. One thing that can help, especially for folks doing later period stuff, there's more and more sources. So you start looking not at just the guy you're studying, but at their peers, folks near them time-wise, geography-wise, and see how do they explain stuff. Um, for those studying the Italian school of rapier, there's a whole slew of people to work from, a lot of which were in a very short period of time, and a lot of which have a lot of similarities. Like, okay, Fabris says this, which is similar to this from Capoferro, but slightly different from this from Gigante or from, you know, um, uh, Fierro or this, some of the others. So, so you can start saying, well, how do other people describe the same thing? And maybe they're trying to say, well, Alfred does it wrong. So I'm going to say my way is better than his because, well, that still teaches you something. Whether you agree with that or not, that contrast or that agreement can inform you and help, help you understand better what that person's trying to teach. Make sense? So, um, you know, more sources gives you more, more input on things. Now, one of the biggest things I see with people that are studying period styles is they kind of learn it, and it's okay when it's used against someone else using that same style and that same level of understanding. That's kind of like saying, well, I know how to fight against someone using a knife as long as they go, eh, 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 and they do that kind of, you know, whatever motion. The ability to understand it to a level where you can adapt it to a wider range of circumstances, that's when you reach true understanding because now you're focused on, well, the principles say this. He describes those principles or he teaches you those principles through this motion and that guard and this action. But the core of what he's trying to teach is this. And if I understand that core, I can then apply it to stuff that he's not dealing with. So then you start saying, okay, how can I deal, how can I use that to deal with that person that does that weird refuse guard? Or that fights case that's not a normal, you know, we allow it, but it's not a normal thing that you'd run it into. Or someone that has the big flowy cloak. Or someone that likes to, to punch. Or someone that does, you know, this weird thing or that weird thing. You know, they fight their Florentine in, in a way that's like, what in the world are they doing? When you can incorporate those core principles well enough against a wider variety of circumstances, then you know you're getting somewhere with it. Um, there's modern discussion on the hierarchy of understanding of stuff, and I'm blanking on it now. Dante's real big on this, on, you know, at this level I can, I kind of know at this level I know it really well, at this level I can adapt it because I'm understanding the core underneath it. Hmm? Maslow's? So. And I ran through that first part a lot faster than I meant to, but that's okay. So anyone doing Italian rapier? No, a little bit, a couple of you. Cap Pharaoh, he's one of the early ones. Pretty book, this is one of, the, one of the early books here. I swear the guy was paid by the word. His book assumes you know nothing and wants to describe everything. Well, he assumes you know how to get dressed, but that's about it. So he talks about the importance of your stance and the placement of your head and what you do about your vita, your, your, your guts, your vitals. Guess how long he takes to describe the placement of your head and what you do with your head while you fight? Huh? Uh, it's about six long paragraphs. Your head should be centered, but not too centered. It should be able to see the entire fight. It should go over your left when you're in guard and over your right when you're attacking. And it should this, and it should that, and it, but this, but not too much. And wow, 
it's a lot. He goes on and on and on. He does something similar when talking about your Vita, talking about your hands, everything. He just, he's verbose. So, yeah. The head, all of that just to describe what do you do with your head. And then there's the Vita, and it goes on for ways. Arms. He likes, he likes to talk. So, trying to figure out what in the world he's talking about can take a while. So, you kind of read through that and say, well, let's kind of put that aside a little bit. Maybe make an assumption or two based on it. And now let's work on other stuff. And then let's revisit it and see if that makes any more sense. For instance, he talks about with your head, it should be over your left when you are in guard and over your right when you're attacking. Well, the basic Capoferro or Italian upright stance is this. It's over my left. And there's reasons. I'll talk about that a little bit. And when you attack, hey, it's over my right. Ah, okay. Fabris has this wonderful, very short little bit. The sword is stronger in the direction in which it points. What? The sword is stronger in the direction in which it points. My understanding of that has to do with one of my favorite aspects of Italian rapier, which is all about sword angles and a strong angle into someone's sword. So if I am facing you and my sword is pointed like this, that's kind of okay. I have strong edge, I have weak edge, assuming your sword is here. If I do nothing more than angle my sword a little bit so that I am angled into your weapon, assuming inside line, any, any interaction between our swords will tend to take you down to my fort, down to my guard, where I have a leverage advantage, where I have a defensive advantage, where I have a control advantage. My sword is stronger in the direction in which it points. Why didn't you just say that? Well, that's why they got money. It's like, I'm going to say this vague fortune teller kind of thing, and then I will explain it to you as I do stuff. So my understanding of that nice, simple phrase is, strong angle into the other person's sword will improve your strength and your control of their weapon. The sword is stronger in the angle in which, uh, the direction in which it points. Okay, makes so much sense. So, Cap Pharaoh, talk about that real briefly here. Well, not so briefly. Nice picture pulled from one of his plates. This is the basic upright Italian stance. So, he's kind of like this. He's kind of way back here. Anyone, anyone use this stance? Stand like this? Like it? Don't like it? Don't understand it? So, the basics of that stance are a couple of things. Oh. So, first of all, keep in mind, these are people that are using swords to keep themselves alive and kill the other person. Unlike what we do now, there's no reset. There's no, oops, I lost that point. I'll try again next time. So, they may not have been super in biology, but they understood enough that your head is important. You get hit in the head, that's bad. Your vita, your guts, that's important. You get hit there, that's bad. So as you start looking at the different plates and the different things they talk about and the guards and the postures and et cetera, it, it boils down to things like whatever's close to your opponent, protect. But when you're talking about rapier, especially the basics with single sword, this is my protection as well as my offense. This is my best defense. So my guard protects my hand and stuff behind it. So if I'm facing him, well, I'm, gonna, I'm threatened by that trash can right there. So right now, everything's pretty well equally threatened by that trash can. Well, if I put my sword down here, that's kind of protecting my Vita. What about my head? Well, what if I get my head further away? Now, what's close, my arm, and then after that, my Vita, is protected by my sword, my head is retreated. Anyone here work with Fabris? Good stuff. I, my legs won't take that. Fabris, one of his basic stances, is here. 
my head is closer, it's behind my guard, my Vita is retreated. I can protect a little bit, what I can't protect I get away from the threat. So, protect myself, protect myself. It's the same concepts executed different ways. When you're defending against a long, pointy, stabby thing, back it up. Now, this is gonna be slightly different if you're dealing with something like longsword, you know, a lot of the Fiori stuff, whatever, because your attack styles, your, your threats are different, so your protections are different. But for Italian Rapier, that's the core underneath that stuff. So I'm gonna be back here. So my weight is now on my back leg. My front leg is pretty nimble. What's closest to my target is protected by my sword. My arm, which is closer to my target, is protect my sword. My head is retreated. I'm either in a fairly narrow profile, or if, say, you're on, your, on the outside line, so somewhere over here, I might take a, a guard in Sukun, the second, where I, what do I do? I lean even further away from that. The idea is my sword kind of div divides threat versus what's protected, so I get it between me. If your sword is on the outside, this is a perfectly good stance too, because what have I done? You can hit me in the head, I'm gonna get it further away. So you'll see that guard in Sukund. Pierce, okay, now I'm gonna be back. Court, court is where I disagree with some people, because for me, court is this, and I'll talk about it more in Gigante, whereas I see a lot of people doing this, and you know, for me, that's, you know, th that is a modern fencing thing because you don't have any mass to your weapons and it's all about speed. But with an Italian rapier, I'll just hit you straight on because that doesn't give you any control of the other person's blade. So, stance. Why is he doing that? Because he doesn't want to get killed. Because that's what this is about, staying alive and then killing the other person. So, guard this way, do this. Now, you look at that, look at that plate, you go back and you read the description about the head. You look at that plate, you go back and you read the description about the Vita, and about the hands, and about the feet, and it suddenly starts to make a little more sense. Hopefully. Should be able to do the same thing when you go back and look at some of the Fiori stuff. Again, keep in mind, what's the typical threat? Is it cuts with a long sword? Is it stabs with a rapier? Is it stabs with a shorter short sword? Oh, thought you, thought you had a question. No, you just had a hello. Speaking of questions and stuff, everyone's sitting there kind of quietly. Commentary, thoughts, things that are making sense or aren't making sense? Nobody? Nope, so far so good? Okay. Now we're going to go to the fun one. The Italian lunge, which I think is a great example. How many people have seen this plate? How many people look like that when they lunge? Huh? I'm not on a fencing strip. So, what's wrong with this stance? Knees way past the ankle. Leaning super far forward. A couple other things, hmm? Everything's committed forward. This is horrible and inefficient if you're fighting modern Olympic fencing. If you're fighting Italian rapier and the philosophy there, this is the way to do it. This works. So, how many people here have experience with, with uh, modern modern Olympic style fencing. A lot of you. So, your weapons are very light. Your hand speed is very important because things are very fast. You actually have right away in two of the three styles to force some kind of a reaction to an attack before you can counterattack. I had to put this artificial right of way concept in there just to make some back and forth rather than both people trying to throw that shot and double, 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 etc. So with a modern lunge, you don't want your knee to go past vertical because the instant it goes past vertical, the stress on your knee goes way up. 
In a modern lunge, your recovery is all about pushing off the front leg to push yourself back. In a modern lunge, you tend to stay very upright so that your weight stays centered over your hips. So again, your legs are what's moving you back and forth very quickly. Back leg to push forward, front leg to push yourself back. It's all very fast and you need to be able to change directions very quickly. So you want to make sure that your knee doesn't go past vertical because you don't want to blow your knee out. I've done that, it's not fun. A modern lunge is also, your front foot moves much farther than an Italian lunge. So it went, what, about a foot length and a half, two feet length from, from here? It's very appropriate for the style and the conditions that it's in. With an Italian lunge, first of all, we're playing for keeps here. It's like a single elimination tourney, and you only get to lose once, ever. How many people here would like to, like to fight that if you ever lost, you had to change your persona, ever? You know, that wouldn't be quite as bad, but it'd still be pretty serious. So, one of the most important things you have to do is you have to control the other person's sword so that you don't get hit. Once you control their sword, you then hit them. So, I need to do things such that with blade work and etc., I may bop around and use measure to try and gain that advantage, and I'll do other things to gain that advantage, and you hear commentaries about things like finding the sword, whatever that is, gaining the sword, some people split them up, some people don't. But I've done something to control Monsieur Trashcan's sword so he can't hit me. Then I take my guard and I extend it away from me to protect more. Now I'm going to swap what's exposed and what's protected as I lunge. Ah, my pants are a little tight here. So I've got his sword controlled. Now my head is, in, is vulnerable, but it's behind my guard, so it's not really. My Vita is now refused from the attack. And my foot only moves about a foot length forward, and I go deeply over it. To recover, I'm not using my front leg at all in the recovery. So I'm not going to stress my knee out. I swing my knee out. I drop my hip a little bit. You hear that little slide? I'm actually pulling my foot back on the recovery. I don't necessarily want to do that, but it's a good way of emphasizing I'm not using my front leg at all in that recovery. I'm not pushing, I'm not using these muscles whatsoever. So that Italian lunge, move out brand protection, gain the sword, start to drop what's going to be exposed behind my guard, start to refuse this lunge, recover in a reverse fashion. So taking that knee well past my ankle works if I recover in such a way that I don't strain it. <laughs> well, there is that too. You may not live as long to actually have serious knee problems, or you have serious knee problems anyway because you have to walk everywhere you go and carry stuff because you don't own a donkey and, you know, whatever. So, yes, there's other health issues there. But for what we're doing, that Italian lunge, that deep lunge well over the knee and stuff, if you do it correctly and you recover correctly, it works. But there's a lot of analysis and playing around and trying to understand the context of why does that work? Because I'm not trying to hit quickly and whatever. I'm trying to be in control. They can't hit me. I control their sword. Now I'm going to commit. And I may not hit them at that commit, but I can do things from there. Big thing is, I'm not risking myself because I'm being sure of my attack. Because I got one chance. Or I don't have one chance. I can only lose once. Um, quite some time ago, I read a study about deaths from combat. And I talked about around the time of the Battle of Hastings, 
how many people they found that had obviously been severely wounded, um, deep bone injuries, broken bones, etc., that obviously healed quite a bit. So these are people that were in the Battle of Hastings or similar combat that lived through it because they got broken bones, they got this, they got that. They may not be in the best of shape, they may be healed with their arm taking a left turn, but those kinds of injuries they could heal from. Contrasted to 16th century and early 17th century duels where you have pointed weapons going into people and they may not be killed by the initial attack, but you know, then you've got infection, you've got people trying to cure the problem, which is often as bad or worse. And so, I mean, there was lots of reasons why duels were outlawed, because a lot of times both people died. We duel, I won, but I'm gonna die anyway too, because you stole to me. So the whole hit them not getting hit, that was really, really important. And that influences how they do the fighting that they do. In some of the earlier stuff, you can take that shot because, ah, uh, they may or may not break my arm, but I can heal from that. I got to survive and kill the other guy. Rapier, I, I can't risk a puncture. That's just bad, all around bad. And again, that stuff may not kill you immediately. There's some other one, there's a, we do have lots of stories from actual duels that happened over time. Everything from a guy took a little cut across the forehead and dropped instantly from the shock. You know, it's like, oh, tip cuts, what, what can happen? Well, they can drop you like that. To a fellow that got, ran completely through the neck more than once, ran completely through the body more than once, won the duel, lived. Yeah, that guy was tough. Um, and, you know, evidently did not get a bad enough infection, so good for him. Um, so you never know about that. But that whole, I can't risk that injury because I, got, I can only lose once. So you got to be careful there. So that really informs it. So looking at that Italian lunge, it's like, well, this is wrong and that doesn't make sense and this doesn't make sense until you start looking at it in the context of what they're trying to do. Now, picking up that context is difficult. So sometimes what do you do? Well, it's like, do what you can to figure it out and then just kind of let it hang and work on other stuff and work on other stuff and revisit it. Just like going back and checking your assumptions. You're not gonna perfectly solve the first plate before you start looking at the second plate. It's like, work on this a bit, then this a bit, then this a bit, then this a bit, then kind of take a bigger picture view. Then work on this a bit and this a bit, you know, and then t take that step back and take that bigger picture view again. How are we doing on time? Oh, we got lots. So it's a very cyclical study of things. You're going back and checking your assumptions constantly. So we've done this stuff. We've worked on our plates. We try to figure things out. What do we do from there? You have to test your assumptions. You have to grow your knowledge. First thing is, can you figure out some kind of a drill to test a plate, to, to emphasize a movement, a behavior, a, a reaction? So look at that. A lot of the Italian stuff is fairly simple. You know, plate 14, they attack like this. I roll here and I hit under the arm. Okay, can you turn that into a drill? And you start with your partner and you get them to kind of do the stuff and you walk through it very slowly and then you know you work on it and you speed up a little bit and then you say okay now we're going to do that but I need you I need you to give me the opportunity sometimes but I don't need you to do a gimme I need you to kind of resist a little bit so then they rather than going well if I do this and give you the opening you can hit me I'm not going to give you the opening or when you try and hit me I'm going to try and parry it not an unreasonable flailing thing but in a reasonable attack I'm going to start resisting is the way you're performing it work against resistance. And so you go from drilling to controlled sparring to slightly less controlled sparring to now free sparring of, I'm gonna do this, we're gonna fight, but you know, throw me that opportunity every now and then, see if I can take advantage of it, or I'm gonna try this every now and then. 
And then for the last step is obviously uncontrolled sparring. I'm in a tournament, I'm facing this guy, I haven't faced in a while, I'm gonna see if I can make this thing work. He doesn't know I'm trying to make it work, I'm just gonna see if I can work it in there. And then, did it work? Did it not work? Did it work because I'm strong, fast, long-limbed, tall? Did it not work because I'm short, I'm a little stout, I'm whatever? If it relies on your athleticism, eh, maybe you're not doing it so well. So, can you make it work for a variety of body types, variety of styles? Obviously, if someone's short, armed like a T-Rex, slow, can't breathe, etc., it's going to be difficult, no matter what. It just is. But if it only works because you're six foot eight and you've got arms out to Nebraska, that's also a problem. So, can you teach it to someone that's not built like you, or can someone can different body styles work on it? And maybe you have to adjust it, adjust it a bit for those different body styles, but can you do that? So keep that in mind as well. St again, work on the stuff, try and figure it out. And really what you're doing is you're starting to put together those drills in the first place. Hey, we're working on plate 12, blah, 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 attacking the tempo of a cavazione. Okay, here we go. Well, I'm going to extend, you do this, and then I do the follow-up. Okay, now it's, I'm going to extend, you're going to do one of these two things. If you do A, I do this, if you do B, I, and you build up those drills. Okay, now we're going to spar a little bit, but every now and then feed me that thing. And you work on that. And then you take it all the way to, I'm in a tournament somewhere, here we go. Or maybe not I'm in a tournament, but hey, I'll work. let's do some pickups for a while. I have some stuff I'm working on, don't worry about it. I'll let you know afterwards. And we fight. And that's probably even for the best because when you get in a tournament situation, a lot of times you have this ego of, I need to win or at least I want to win. Um, if you strongly work on a period style, a lot of times your skill level, if you're anywhere good at all, it's gonna drop because you're doing things differently. And you have to resist that temptation to fall back into your old habits and your old ways of doing things. And you gotta just kind of work through it. Now you also need to reevaluate, am I slumped because I'm doing something new or am I slumped because I'm doing something new that doesn't work? And that's a hard evaluation to make. This is why it's a lot easier to do this sort of thing with multiple people. So they can say, no, I think it's working, but, but roll your hand more, or don't be so upright, or whatever, and you can do the small tweaks and stuff. But you gotta, you know, honest self-assessment is one of the most important things you can do when you're studying a period thing like this. A lot of, a lot of stuff out there, a lot of books, a lot of things on YouTube especially the stuff on YouTube, huge grain of salt. Don't assume they know what they're doing. A lot of that stuff I look at and they go, well, you're doing the motions of the plate, but you're saying they're going to attack like this, and then I do whatever, but what they're doing is they're attacking like this. Well, guess what? Your counter worked because they attack like this and not an actual threat. So, yeah. If you can make it work against those weird people, you know, that lefty that does this refuse thing, um, someone fighting Case, you know, someone like Benjamin, boing, 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 boing. Um, if anyone's fought this uh, Duke, I think he's out in Kalantir now, um, Radu, nicknamed Moose, he makes Vlad look small. He was about 6'6", six, six, broad shoulders, wrists like my thighs, I think, a just big guy. If you can make it work against him, you're doing pretty good. So, questions, comments? There is definitely, there will be some cases where things may not, absolutely may not work. But sometimes that's where you take that step back and say, maybe not the specific thing, but the core concepts. Yes. And like my next class is gonna talk about some of these core concepts. But yeah, that, that can also be very disillusioning. Well, this works okay until I fight this guy or that guy or whatever, because they do this weird stuff or they have physical advantages, or maybe you're just not quite doing it right so it works okay against A and B, but not so well against C and D. Or maybe your poor assumption in the first place that you need to grab 
and and this is and this is where having multiple viewpoints, having other people to bounce ideas off of that understand what you're trying to do, that you're working collectively against is why is this thing not work against Alfred? You know, I do this and this and he just right through it. Well, maybe this, try that, control it, change it, etc. <laughs> and then there's sword and shield. For the armored side, and part of this is because of the restrictions of the rule set, sword and shield, you get a big shield, and yes, there's stuff you can do, but you can turtle up behind a shield pretty well. You know, because it's above the knee, and it's here and it's there. And so, yes, a very skilled fighter can still work that and find the openings. On the rapier side, it's toe tip to top of the head, and a valid blow is very simple. So there's not that ability to, maybe I can't throw a killing blow, but I can turtle up and stay alive pretty well in armored combat. Um, rapier is kind of the flip, the flip of flop. The, the flip of that is very easy for someone to attack and, and get a killing blow in. And so that part's very simple. So, you know, your defense becomes more important. It just, it's just different, different emphasis. And it's because of the restrictions of the rule set and the safety requirements, et cetera. Commentary? So far, so good? Okay, thank you all very much. Um, hopefully I'll see some of you in another five, 10 minutes.